This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Welcome back, everyone. It is that time once again. We are going to look at work submitted by viewers like you. I've got some awesome stuff to share with you today. I think you're going to dig this. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so first up, we have two little books. This is Alpine Panoramics 1 and Alpine Panoramics 2. These come to us from Lee Johnson. Lee also includes a note which reads, Hey Ted, Lee Johnson here. You featured a couple of my projects a few years back, Green, Blue, Gray, Pacific Northwest, and Swiss Alp Ski Lifts. Here's another long-term project, long-term in the sense that it can actually take years to capture some of these cloud inversions slash light. The work is starting to get interest, and I'm now printing it fairly frequently, which is nice. Enjoy the print and books. Cheers, Lee. So as the names imply, Alpine Panoramics 1 and 2 feature a series of panorama images. These were all done with the Hasselblad X-Pan camera. And for those of you who are not familiar with what the Hasselblad X-Pan was, so most of you probably know that Hasselblad are known since the 1940s for developing medium form format cameras that choose a larger surface area than what you're going to get off a 35 millimeter camera. The idea with the X-Pan was to still use that Hasselblad image format, but to project it onto 35. So while you didn't get the height, you got the width, and they were really cool panoramic cameras back in their day. And in terms of size, because they're 35 millimeter cameras, they're actually much smaller than having to lug a medium format camera around. These images are really cool. I think the really neat thing for me is the contrast between these two books. Alpine Panoramics 1 is pretty purist in the sense that it only features just the landscape, clouds, and sky. And when you get into Alpine Panoramics 2, you start to see other things introduced, such as houses, sometimes people, ski lifts, things of that nature. But Lee, you've done a really nice job with these. I love the way the books are printed. The paper is a little thick. It uses a cover weight throughout for my taste, but I think it works well in this context, actually, because you don't have a whole lot of images. The books are pretty small, and they kind of give it, I don't know, a little more flatness to it. I actually like it in this instance, and I'm not a big fan of heavyweight paper in books. But I think what I love the most about this is that both of these books have a combination of sort of a traditional landscape feel that's really well done. I'll show you a print in a second. I mean, the, the quality is excellent on these. I think the lighting is excellent. Everything is really well done. I know that these take a long time to do. And when you hike this far and when you travel this far to get an image, it's not like you're gonna get 10 images from a session to use. Most likely you're gonna have one. That's just the case with landscape photography. But I think one of the things that's of particular interest to me about these are the vantage points that Lee is using pretty consistently. They're unusual. So like this one was taken from really high up in terms of vantage point. And this is something that in the confines of traditional landscape photography, you've got big cameras because you're trying to get the highest image quality, right? You're probably shooting on eight by 10 film and you're hauling a lot of stuff with you. And therefore it becomes a little bit limiting on how much hiking you want to do, how high you want to go, what kind of vantage point you're going to get. And I think one of the things that's very charming about all of these is that Lee's chosen the X-Pan camera and that 35 millimeter panoramic format for these and lightens his load up considerably, I'm sure. I would love to actually talk to him about this because this is just, it's fascinating to me and it's something that I've talked about going way back years ago with videos. You know, in the 1950s and 60s when 35 millimeter really became pretty much the standard format, in terms of doing things like photojournalism or sports photography or anything where you need to be in the moment, this changed photography quite a bit, the advent of 35 millimeter, because all of a sudden you could get shots a lot faster and you could get them into situations where it was just too cumbersome to set up larger cameras, especially large format. Of course, today it's really easy to take all of that for granted because we all have a camera on our phone in our pocket and so it's super small and super portable. But what I really love about this whole project with Alpine Panoramics was that the camera choice with this allowed him to get vantage points and travel in a way that probably would have been a lot slower and more cumbersome with larger equipment. And the quality is still incredible. He sent a print and I just, I don't know if you'll pick this up on the video, but this is really cool. So while we don't have the height in the image, it's certainly long and it creates a really interesting aspect ratio. I really love these. And when you get up close, you can see there is plenty of detail in here. These are really nice. Lee, you're making me want to get an X-Band, some hiking boots and a really big jacket so I can go do some really cool land. These are really gorgeous. Gorgeous. I love the play in the snow and the light. Really well done. And uh, I will link to Lee's books below. You guys should check him out. He's doing some great work. Highly recommend you get these. I'll be linking everybody, of course, that I show up. So check the show description. All right, so next up is this book, which comes to us from Travis Ludkow. This is called Europe Equinautical Light. 
Travis also included a note which reads, Hey Ted, thank you for all your inspiring videos over the years. Your channel helped inspire me to focus on creating bodies of work instead of just single images. And the perfect opportunity came up last year when I had a once in a lifetime chance to visit Europe for an extended period of time. It feels great to have created something tangible that I'm proud of. I hope you enjoy it, and I hope it finds a place in your collection. Many thanks, Travis. So I really love Equinautical Light. First of all, the title is great. Second of all, it shows us Europe, but it also explores a lot of visual themes in here, and I think that Travis has a really good skill and a really good talent for thinking in terms of geometry, thinking in terms of light. I love the way the images are paired up in here. Travis also shoots in a wide range of styles, which I think is really cool, too. He's got a lot of range to the work he does. It's really nice. The other thing that I love about this is he's varying up the angles. Sometimes you have a point of view that is from a high vantage point. Sometimes it's from a low vantage point. I think he's done a really good job of creating a lot of variety in terms of what we're looking at in this book. I mean, seriously, the range is really impressive. We have everything from still life to landscape to street photography. It's, it's a really interesting collection. Now, one thing that I would say, just as a little bit of criticism on here, is sometimes it is so varied that it makes a little bit of a cluttered statement visually. And I don't mean that as a bad thing necessarily, but I think your work would have a stronger impact if you kind of picked one thing and went with that. I think for me, and I mean this as a sincere compliment, Travis, I think your strongest work in here is the architectural stuff. I think you have a really strong sense of geometry and how that plays with light. And I think that's the most interesting aspect of this. It's not to belittle the other stuff, but I'm just saying there's so much strong work here. And also with the shift between black and white and color, it doesn't have as jarring an effect with the architectural stuff. I think there's just so much going on that I think if you simplified the statement a little bit, it would have a stronger impact in the end. And one point of criticism that I do want to make, and I know I'm gonna sound like a broken record because I say this about a lot of work that comes in. And look, I understand we're photographers, not graphic designers, but this is worth pointing out because if you tighten up just a few things, it's just gonna have such a stronger visual impact in the end that I think it would be worth doing. So a couple of things. First of all, you run titles of locations on each image. I'm not sure that that's important or necessary. I know it's probably important for you because you were there and you took them and you feel like you should label them, but for me, it really doesn't do anything to it. But let's just assume for a second that they are important and I wanna point something else out. So on each one of these spreads, you put your images aligned in the center. And I know that's what software just enables you to do is tighten it up and snap it to the center. However, if you're gonna run type underneath, you gotta realize that these work as a pair, the typography as well as the image. I think what would work more effectively is if you shrunk your images down to give yourself more room, center the whole thing up as a unit and not just the image, and I think it would breathe much better. I think you have room to go with the borders. I know everybody wants to go full bleed or take as much space as possible because you're paying for a book and you want to maximize, but that's not always the right thing to do. The other thing is if you are gonna get rid of the typography on here is you might even consider centering them up with what we call visual center. And if you don't know what that is, look it up and figure that out. It's like, sometimes they also call, call this museum centering. So if you go to a museum or a gallery, the images, generally speaking, are not centered right on the wall exactly. They're a little more at eye level and that's what we call visual center. And you can also cheat in your layout and just push them up just a hair to where they're not perfectly centered. And I think it would give it a little more breadth. Those are super nitpicky comments. Otherwise, I think this is a very strong book. I wanna see you do more work and I wanna see you keep going. But that's what I would do is I would simplify it. You're capable of a wide range of work. Pick something that's a strong direction and stick with that and make that the statement of the book. And I think you're gonna have something that's really strong in the end. Otherwise, Travis, awesome job. All right, so I've got two more zines that I want to share. There's one that deals with night images and another one that's a collective of about 80 photographers. It's really good. So I wanna get into these, but real quick, I wanna give a shout out to our sponsor today who are the always awesome folks over at Square. Squarespace. How easy is it to build an amazing website in a matter of minutes? Squarespace has you covered. It's dead simple. Head over to Squarespace, hit get started. You can start by selecting from an impressive collection of customizable templates, or you can do what I do, build your own. Something unique because, you know, you're not like other websites. Give your site a name. Next, you can build your homepage. We'll start with a few preset layouts just to get us going. Want to sell products like books or prints? Well, you can feature those on your homepage. Create a few more sections if you want. Let's also give it a color palette. There's a whole bunch to choose from. And just get us started. We can change this all later. Next, let's select the typography choices. Welcome to your website. 
Everything is set up and it's all ready for you to customize. Squarespace is built on Fluid Engine, the next generation of website design. Select Edit and Fluid Engine allows you to drag, place, and resize any element on the page. You can snap these to a grid, you can make them float on top of one another, you can freeform however you like. You can even preview and adjust how the site looks on either desktop or mobile. The layouts are independent. Of course, you'll want a portfolio for your work. Creating an image gallery is as easy as dropping a folder of images on your web browser. Once uploaded, you can drag to resort, customize the look, and Squarespace writes all of the code for you. Everything just works and it looks fabulous. Want to sell your own prints, books, or zines? Squarespace has the capabilities to not only set up your online store and collect payments, but they also give you all the tools that you're going to need to be successful. Managing shipping and payment options, manage your orders and engage with your customers. They even give you the tax tools that you need to keep things organized and stay compliant. You should try Squarespace for yourself. It's absolutely free, no credit card required. Just go to squarespace.com AOP, sign up for that free trial. If you decide Squarespace is right for you, I can save you an additional 10% on your order by using offer code AOP on checkout. That's right, the code is AOP. So stop procrastinating, go build your website today. And I want to give a special shout out and thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. All right, so next up we have this little zine called All Night Thing. This comes to us from Ian Clark and also includes a note, which I want to read to you. He says, hi, Ted, I hope you were keeping well. I always thought my first collection would be landscape and seascape work, but it turns out it was street. This collection was a year in the making as I focused on a theme and proceeded to work towards building a decent collection of images that I could turn into a zine, my first zine. A long drawn out process, learning how to use software, how to build a narrative flow with the images I had, etc. But I was pleased at the end result and it's encouraged me to do more. Why all night thing? Well, the images are taken at night and I kind of think of the finished product as, well, a thing. So it happens to be a song by Temple of the Dog melding my two favorite bands, so it kind of worked out as a title. The zine does follow a narrative, but I want people to figure it out and see if they can build the story themselves. I hope to do more zines in the future, and I'm excited to continue this journey of learning more about the art of photography. See what I did there? Thank you for all the work you do. Take it easy, Ian. Okay, so Ian, this is really nice. I really like the idea, I like the concept, I like that you're going for something that's narrative, and I think that the decision to do something at night specifically has made some really interesting interesting results here. I think the color palette in these is outstanding. You've got a lot of these cool yellows and greens and blues that pop in, and I really love the work. I think it's absolutely fantastic. The only comment that I would make on this, if you want some criticism, is that I think you might look into varying up the way that your images are being presented. And allow me to explain just a little bit. So you make very heavy use of shooting through a window from the outside, and I think this is really strong. And I would actually say that this work has kind of a cinematic dialogue going on. It has a very movie-like feel. I like the way that you vary up using sometimes square imagery, sometimes it's portraits, sometimes it's landscape, and I think that's pretty solid. But I think that you're going for the window thing so much that it becomes, I wouldn't say tedious, but it becomes expected. You know, expect to see a bunch of window variations. I do like the fact that some of them are abstract. You just see shapes of people. They're not too abstract. I can still make out what's going on. And I like the fact that sometimes I can see them. But the way you start this book out, and I think this is really interesting, is you have some shots that are not window at all. You have some car details that are going on here. And I'm not really sure how it's gonna fit into your narrative and what you're trying to say, but if you're gonna think of something as being cinematic, I think this is something to watch for when you're watching movies, actually. I have a very good friend who does video work, and this is one of the things that he taught me a long time ago, is that when you're doing something that's going to be cinematic in nature and you're telling a story, one of the things that you can do to help with your visual interest is one, vary up your vantage points. So you have these styles of these close-ups of, of car details, and then you go to the windows thing. And the other thing that you can do is actually start to vary your focal length up. So use a wide angle lens, move to a tight angle lens, and try to develop a little bit of visual interest doing something like that. I think you're onto something that is really good here, and I think that it's really strong, but I think just giving a little bit more variance into what that narrative is and trying to find a way so it's not all windows, because I get the cars at the beginning, and then I get the windows, and I'm like, wow, this is really interesting. It's got my interest. And as I go through, the window thing 
loses its appeal a little bit, even though it's really strong. And I come to just expect, okay, what's the next window shot going to be? So that is my only advice to you is I would just try to vary it up just a little bit. Other than that, I think this is very strong work. I think it has an enormous amount of interest. I love the simple concept. I love the way that you're uh, showing that concept through the images and the way that you're delivering it to the viewer. This is really nice. You should be very proud. So Ian, thank you for sending. It's awesome. So next up is this book, which is called The Collective Volume 3. This comes to us from Don Giannotti. Great name. Collective Volume 3 features the work of, it says, 80 different photographers. These are students of Don's, which I think is very cool. Don also includes a letter in here, which reads, Hi, Ted, this is from Don Giannotti. I teach photography to a small group of photographers who want to go professional in the commercial realm. As you know, this is a tough genre to break into, but my students have been successful in getting to that level they want to achieve. Success in this business can only come from strong commitment, long hours of hard work. We stress that in every part of our project, assignment, and review process, and the students step up. For the last four years, I have produced this book featuring the work of my wonderful students. We missed 2020 for some reason. I can't remember. Anyway, something happened. Anyway, this is this year's collective, and I hope that you enjoy the work of these truly hardworking photographers. By the way, my demographic is a little older than the traditional art school. Lots of these photographers are starting second careers and some even third. I have students from all over the world, and they have a shot for some big client names. Enjoy the book, and thanks again for your contribution to the world of photography. Don. So I'm not going to critique this like I do a lot of the other works. This is just a really fabulous collection of student work that is very impressive, especially when you consider these are people doing second and third careers in some cases cases like sometimes you see work of people coming out of school who are probably in their 20s or so and you know you expect it to look a certain way and you can tell some kids work really hard and they do. but when you're dealing with people who are really no longer kids this is very impressive work um nice job i will put links to this below and if you want to learn more about don's stuff it's project52prosystem.com. I'll, I'll link to everybody in the show description below. So please go support your colleagues. And uh, Don, please let your students know that they're doing some very impressive work in here. I talk a little bit about commercial photography. That is, I mean, I'm not a f commercial photographer, so that is not part of my world at all. But uh, I do have the utmost respect for people who do that and execute. Being able to do work for clients on an assignment basis, which is not exactly your vision. In fact, it rarely is. It's usually the client's vision. It's a very difficult tightrope to walk, and this is why I respect commercial photographers, because the very best ones do have their own vision and their own style and their own artistic temperament and their own visual statement that they're putting across, and they're able to do that in the context of the needs of a client. And that is something that there's like two things put together that are very hard to bring together. And so people who do that, who are very successful about it, I have an enormous amount of respect for, but there's some wonderful work in here. I'm very impressed. I mean, this is it, there's a maturity to some of this that's, uh, it, it, it's not on the student level. It is outstanding. So Don, thank you for sharing. You guys check everybody out in the show description below. I will see you all in the next video. Until then, later.